Hello Psych 299 Statistics students, this is Larry Hatcher. Uh, this is another one of my video lectures. This one is another in my series on analysis of variance with one between subjects factor. Uh, this one is module 132.30, between versus within variance. As you watch this presentation, uh, please follow along with lecture notes. I've made them available uh, for you on Canvas. Go to Canvas, go to Psych 299. On the left side, select Files. That'll reveal a bunch of folders that are available. Go to the folder called Psych 299 Lecture 132.30 Between Variants. Uh, within there, you'll see two files you can download. Uh, they're both called Psych 299 Lecture 132.30 Between Variants Blank. One of them is a Word document. One of them is a PDF document. As I've said before, if you have a choice, it's best to open the Word document because you can follow along. And as I fill in blanks as I go through this lecture, you'll be able to actually type in the words that are missing uh, if it's the Word document. Uh, the two documents are identical, however. Our objectives for this lecture, by the end of it, you should be able to explain the difference between the concept between groups variance versus within groups variance. You should be able to evaluate relative amount of between versus within variance that's illustrated in a graph. Ideally, I like my students to be able to look at a graph, uh, a dot plot that shows the dots represent the scores for people on the dependent variable. I want them to be able to look at it and compare two graphs and tell me this one has more between variance, that one has less between variance. This one has more within variance, that one has less within variance. I want you to be able to identify the graph that's more likely to display statistically significant results. Hopefully we'll be able to do those things by the end of our lecture. We're going to illustrate concepts in this module with the same illustrative investigation we used in the previous module. Imagine you've conducted an investigation like this. You're working with a sample of 21 college students. Eventually you're going to manipulate an independent variable that we'll call financial incentives. Your question, uh, will financial incentives be, uh, will, in will financial incentives affect the amount of exercise engaged in by these students. In the investigation, your dependent variable is going to be the minutes of aerobic exercise that they get in a typical week. Here's a figure that illustrates possible results. You haven't conducted the study yet, so you don't know what you're going to get, but you'd be pleased to get results something like this. Uh, independent variable is represented by points on the x-axis. Independent variables, financial incentives. Eventually, you're going to randomly assign seven students to the low incentive condition, different seven to the medium incentive condition, different seven to the high incentive condition. At the end of the semester, you'll measure the average minutes of exercise that a participant engaged in in a typical week. Uh, that will be your y-axis variable here, exercise minutes. Uh, the big open dots represent mean scores displayed by the various conditions. Uh, the whiskers that extend above and beyond them are the error, uh, error bars represent 95% confidence intervals for the means. If you got an outcome like this, it would indicate that your high incentive group engaged in many exercise minutes per week, whereas the medium exercise group engaged in a less and the low exercise group also engaged in a less. Uh, we'll see if that's the kind of outcome you get by the end of this investigation. Analysis of variance is more complicated than independent samples t-test, and I mentioned this in a previous lecture, because when you do ANOVA, there's actually two kinds of significance tests that are performed when you perform one-way ANOVA. There is an omnibus significance test. The omnibus significance test is the test of the overall effect of your independent variable on the dependent variable. Uh, this reveals our first fill in the blank, any place 
that I've highlighted something in yellow. That means that's a term that's blanked out of the document that you are looking at. You need to fill it in as you listen to my lecture. Uh, once again, omnibus significance test investigates the overall effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. With the omnibus test, you're asking, did my independent variable have any kind of effect on the dependent variable? I'm not getting specific and looking at conditions, but was there an overall significant effect? The other kind of significant significance test that's performed with one-way ANOVA is focused comparison significance test. With focused comparison significance tests, you're looking at the difference between means of two specific conditions. I have to look at our figure that we were looking at before. If you were focusing on focused comparison significance tests, you'd ask questions like, is there a statistically significant difference between the mean score shown by the high incentive group versus the medium incentive group? That is an example of a focused comparison. Uh, that is the second kind of significance test that we look at with one-way analysis variance. Now, we will deal with these focused comparisons later on. Right now, the current lecture is going to deal only with the omnibus significance test. Was there an overall effect of my independent variable on the dependent variable? Uh, omnibus research hypothesis in analysis of variance is your prediction concerning the overall nature of the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable. For the current investigation, our omnibus research hypothesis might say something like this. Financial incentives have an effect on exercise minutes displayed by college students. Not getting specific and saying which specific conditions going to score higher than another. I'm just making an omnibus hypothesis that financial incentives will have some kind of effect on exercise minutes. When we perform ANOVA, there are different kinds of null hypotheses that we investigate. The omnibus statistical null hypothesis is the prediction of zero overall relationship between the independent variable and dependent variable. In other words, the omnibus statistical null hypothesis is the prediction of no differences between any of the conditions being compared. Uh, this is the omnibus, uh, this omnibus statistical null hypothesis is the one that this lecture is going to focus on. When you do analysis of variance, the omnibus statistical null hypothesis in general can be stated symbolically this way. The null hypothesis is mu sub 1 is equal to mu sub 2 is equal to mu sub 3 is equal to mu sub k. Now remember mu, the Greek letter mu, is the symbol for a mean score in the population. And with this general form of the null hypothesis, this little subscript K. Uh, subscript K represents the number of conditions in the investigation. Uh, in general, you're saying in the population, there's no difference between any of the conditions with respect to their mean scores on the dependent variable. Now that's in general. What about for our current investigation? How would we state that a statistical null hypothesis for this study? Well, we have three conditions, so we would state it this way. Uh, mu for the low condition is equal to mu for the medium condition is equal to mu for the high condition. In verbal terms, in the population, there's no difference between participants in the low incentive condition, medium incentive condition, or high incentive condition with respect to their mean scores on the dependent variable exercise minutes. That's the statistical null hypothesis that we're going to test. It's the omnibus statistical null hypothesis. As is usually the case when we test a null hypothesis, we hope in the end to be able to reject this null hypothesis. If we can reject it, it's going to be one piece of the puzzle showing that maybe our independent variable is useful. Maybe it has some kind of an effect on participant behavior. In a later module, we'll show you how to compute the obtained F statistic to test this null hypothesis. We're not going to focus much on the computation of the F statistic now, except to give it to you in very broad strokes. The way you compute an obtained F statistic goes like this. The obtained F statistic is computed by taking the mean square between 
dividing it by the mean square within. And yes, later on we'll talk about what mean square between is, what mean square within is. The point at this point, uh, the no effect value for this F statistic is 1.0. Uh, no effect value is the kind of statistic you would expect to see if your independent variable didn't have any effect on the dependent variable at all. We generally hope to reject null hypotheses, so in order to reject the null omnibus statistical null hypothesis in NOVA, your obtained F statistic has got to be larger than 1.0. Later we'll talk about how you determine how much larger it's got to be. Uh, this lecture is going to focus on defining uh, what do you mean by mean square between the numerator in this equation? What do you mean by mean square within the denominator in this equation? It'll explain what you have to do in order to get a large F statistic. Uh, what you have to do at least to increase the chances of getting a large F statistic. Let's do kind of a thought experiment. Uh, imagine that in the population College students engage in an average of 35.86 minutes of exercise per week. Uh, therefore, we can say mu is equal to 35.86. You'll recall that mu is our symbol for the mean in the population. If you look at the entire population of college students all across the world, if you measured how many minutes of exercise they got, you would find that on average, they get an average of 35.86 minutes of exercise in a typical week. Now that's the population, every college student in the world. Uh, let's get away from the population talk about a sample. Let's imagine, once again in our thought experiment, imagine you drew a random sample of just 21 college students from this population. What would you expect the grand mean for your 21 participants to be? You drew a random sample of 21 college students from the population. You measured how many minutes of exercise that each of these 21 students get. You computed their mean. We're going to call that the grand mean because it's the mean based on the total sample of 21 participants. Uh, if you drew this random sample of students, what mean number of exercise minutes would you expect them to display? The answer, on average, you would expect the grand mean for these 21 participants to be 35.86 minutes. Yes, that's exactly the mean for the population that I described in the previous slide. Uh, with other things being held constant, any time you draw a random sample from a larger population and compute the mean score, your best guess uh, as to what sample mean is likely to be is whatever the population mean is. Uh, population of all college students in the world, mean number of exercise minutes they engaged in was 35.86 minutes. So if I drew a random sample of 21 participants, measured how many minutes of exercise they got, I can't guess with any kind of accuracy what the mean is going to be, but my best guess is 35.86 minutes, the same as the population mean. That's one aspect of our thought experiment. Let's take thought experiment one stage farther. Um, if the null hypothesis were true, if the independent variable doesn't have any effect on the dependent variable at all, what we, would we expect the mean for each of our three treatment conditions to be? Now remember, uh, the null hypothesis predicts there's no differences between any of the conditions in the population. Uh, if we drew our random sample of 21 participants, we randomly assign seven of them to be in the low incentive condition, seven to be in the medium incentive condition, seven to be in the high incentive condition. What mean score would we expect to see for the seven people in the low incentive condition, for the seven people in the medium incentive condition, and so forth? What is our best guess? Answer, the mean score for each of these treatment conditions should also be 35.86 minutes. Mean should be 35.86 minutes for each of the three treatment conditions. Uh, again, 
we don't know for sure what the treatment condition means are going to be, but we do, do know that in the population, the mean score is 35.86 minutes. So if you don't know anything else, and if you assume the null hypothesis if true, is true, you assume your independent variable has no effect, your best guess is that the people in the low incentive condition in your experiment is going to show a mean score of 35.86 minutes. Seven people in your medium incentive condition, same score, 35.86 86 minutes. Seven people in your high incentive condition, same score, 35.86 minutes. Uh, that is what we would expect theoretically if the null hypothesis were true. Independent variable has no effect. Well, let's think about this more carefully. Not exactly 35.86 minutes. In the real world, we would expect some of our groups, that is, some of our treatment conditions, to score above 35.86 and some of them to score below 35.86 merely due to sampling error. Now remember what sampling error is. We defined that in a couple of previous lectures. Uh, in general, sampling error is the difference between sample statistics versus corresponding population parameters due to the fact that samples are usually not perfectly representative of our populations. Uh, if your sample is not perfectly representative of the population, then the sample mean is not going to be exactly equal to the population mean. Uh, the thing is, sampling error gets worse as samples get smaller. Our study, we had teeny little samples. We had just seven people in each of our treatment conditions, and therefore we know that each of these three treatment conditions is not going to show a mean exactly equal to 35.86 minutes. On the next slide, I give you a more realistic kind of outcome. On this slide, it says condition means are now slightly different. They now reflect sampling error. Now, my dashed horizontal line still represents the grand mean for the sample. And just to keep things simple, uh, we're going to continue to assume that the grand mean for the sample is still 35.86 minutes. But we know there's sampling error because it's just seven people in each of these conditions. Uh, each of these uh, treatment condition means is not going to be exactly equal to 35.86. And that's what we see. Uh, this dot is a little bit below the dashed line. So this sample of seven people scored a little lower than 35.86 minutes. Uh, this one's just a smidgen below 35.86. And this condition is somewhat above 35.86. We'd see this, expect to see this kind of variability from the mean merely due to sampling error. And because we have differences from the mean, we can say that we now have some between groups variability. One of the big concepts that I want you to understand by the end of this lecture is what do we mean when we say between groups variability? Next slide defines it. Between groups variability, it is the extent to which the means of the various treatment conditions deviate from the grand mean of the total sample. In symbolic terms, remember we're dealing with sample means now, not population. Uh, the mean for a given treatment condition, um, the mean for one of our three treatment conditions is represented by this generic mean, M with a K subscript. Uh, the mean for uh, the total sample of 21 subjects, the grand mean, is represented by this symbol. Between groups variability is the extent to which the means of the various treatment conditions deviate from the grand mean of my total sample of 21 participants. I illustrate that in this slide. Uh, this is the same slide I showed you before, but now I've given you some specific numbers. Uh, this slide says condition means now deviate from the grand mean. Grand mean for all 21 subjects is still 35.86. Uh, these big black dots represent the mean shown by the three treatment conditions, and now I have assigned numbers to them. A low incentive condition showed a mean score of 30.43. Uh, seven people in the medium incentive condition displayed a mean score of 33.29. Seven people in the high incentive condition displayed a mean score of 43.86. Uh, because each of these dots rep, uh, deviate a little bit from the grand mean, we now have some between groups deviation, some between groups variability.
Whenever you do perform analysis of variance, you're always going to see some between groups variability. In analysis of variance, between groups variability is always going to be caused by at least one cause, and in some cases by two different causes. Uh, between groups variability is just about always going to be caused by sampling error. Uh, anytime you do an investigation in the real world, your samples are not going to be perfectly representative of the populations they come from. Smaller the sample is, the worse the sampling error is going to be. So you're almost always going to have some between groups variability due to sampling error. In some cases, uh, this between groups variability will also be caused by an additional cause, and that is there may be some between groups variability caused by the treatment effect. This is a good point to define treatment effect. Treatment effect refers to differences between the means that can be attributed to the manipulation of your independent variable. Stronger the treatment effect, the greater the between groups variability. Now if you're the one conducting the investigation, you hope that there will be between groups variability due to the treatment effect. Uh, in most cases you hope that your independent variable will have an effect on the dependent variable. So between groups variability might be affected by up to two sources of variability. We need some way of quantifying this concept. We need a statistic that will quantify our between groups variability. Statistic that we use to quantify between groups variability in analysis variance is called the mean square between groups, represented by this symbol ms with a bn subscript. E ms means mean square, bn subscript means it's uh, the between groups mean square. You will see this statistic a lot. Uh, what I want you to remember is it's going to be the primary statistic that we use to quantify our between groups variability. Mean square between groups. In analysis of variance, this is the statistic that reflects between groups variability. The larger the value, the greater the variability between the means of the various treatment conditions in the investigation. A minute ago, I showed you the generic formula for computing an obtained F statistic. The mean square between groups is the numerator in this formula. Notice I've got the red arrow pointing at the numerator. In computing obtained F statistic, uh, the numerator is going to be mean square between. We'll come back and revisit this concept of mean square between groups in a minute but we're not done talking about sources of variability. Notice there's a denominator in this formula, the mean square within. We can turn our attention to that. Between groups of variability is not the only kind of variability that you have in analysis of variance. You'll also see within groups variability. Within groups variability is the extent to which the scores of individual participants, which we'll represent with the symbol X, it's the extent to which the scores of individual participants deviate from the mean of their treatment condition. Uh, once again, representing using the same symbol as before, M with a K subscript. Um, within groups variability is illustrated in the next graph. Now, this graph is similar to the graph that I showed you before. The large black dots still represent mean scores shown by the individual treatment conditions. Uh, the horizontal dashed line is still the grand mean based on all 21 participants. Uh, this large black dot represents the mean score shown by the seven people in the low incentive condition. This black dot represents the mean score shown by the seven people in the medium incentive condition and so forth. But I've now added to the figure some smaller open dots and these represent the scores that are displayed by individual participants. There should be seven dots in this cluster of dots. And the location of these dots represent scores on the dependent variable displayed by individual people. This dot represents a person that engages in 47 minutes of exercise in a typical week. This dot represents somebody that engages in maybe 43 minutes of exercise in a typical week. Uh, focus only on the seven dots in this first cluster. 
notice that they don't all score at the treatment condition mean. Some of them score above the mean of their treatment condition, some of them below the treatment condition. This is within groups variability. You see why we call it within groups variability? There's variability within this treatment condition. By the same token, if you focus on this treatment condition, there are seven dots in this cluster of dots. The large black dot represents the mean score shown by all seven people. Uh, location of the open smaller dots represent mean scores shown by individual people. Notice there is variability within this treatment condition. This represents within groups variability. On the next slide, I just try to make things even more concrete by looking closely only at the low incentive condition. Same information that I shared before. Uh, the mean score for the seven people was 30.43. Uh, this location of this dot represents one of our subjects. It's her X score on the dependent variable. This dot represents a different subject's X score on the dependent variable and so forth. Uh, this is the within groups variability for just the low incentive treatment condition. I could do the same kind of thing with the other three treatment conditions if I wanted. Well, if we're going to have a concept of within groups variability, we need a statistic to quantify this within groups variability. Uh, the statistic we'll use is the mean square within groups. Symbol for the mean square within groups is MS with the WN subscript. MS once again means mean square. WN is the symbol for within groups mean square. Uh, this mean square within groups goes by a couple of different names. I want you to be familiar with these names. Uh, if there's a concept that goes by several different names and the names are almost equally popular, it is reasonable for me to test you on the alternative names for this concept. I want you to know that mean square within groups is sometimes referred to as mean square residual. It is sometimes referred to as mean square error. Uh, in fact, this concept mean square error, let's explain why that is so. I'm going back two uh, slides earlier. You don't necessarily need to look different place in your notes, but why do they call it mean square error? Think about it this way. Focus only on the first cluster of scores, cluster of scores displayed by the people in the low incentive condition. This was the mean for the low incentive condition. Uh, this dot represents the score that was shown by one of the people in the low incentive condition. How come this person engaged in more minutes of exercise compared to the average person? The answer is we have no idea. Maybe this person engaged in more exercise because they're more motivated. Maybe they engaged in more exercise because they're young. We have no idea why they engaged in more exercise. And therefore, we have to think of this as error variability. It's unknown variability. We don't know why this person scored higher. We don't know why this person scored lower. That's why they call it error variability. Uh, and that is why, moving forward again, uh, when we have a statistic uh, to represent within groups variability, in my lecture I'll call it mean square within groups mostly, but I want you to know that other books call it mean square residual and other books still call it mean square error. Now we move forward. Uh, mean square within reflects sort of the typical within groups variability averaged across the three treatment conditions. Think about it this way. Focus only on the first cluster of dots. Uh, notice how much variability there is within this cluster. Notice how much the typical person varies from the mean of their cluster if you focus only on the low incentive condition. Now keep that variability in mind. Move to the next cluster of scores, the cluster of scores for the medium incentive condition. Notice how much the typical person in this group deviates from the mean of their condition. Keep that in mind. Go to the last cluster. Notice how much typical person in the high incentive condition deviate from the mean of their condition. Notice how much variability there is within this condition. Now imagine you could sort of average the within groups variability that you saw in these three different conditions. Uh, the average of those three measures 
we would call the mean square within groups. Now, strictly speaking, they don't actually take the mathematical average. But that's the way I want you to think of the mean square within groups. It's the typical variability that's displayed within the typical treatment condition. Next slide. Uh, mean square within groups, um, what's the significance of it? When we're talking about mean square within groups, the larger the value, the greater the variability within the treatment conditions. Uh, that's why some folks call this mean square error. Think of this within groups error uh, variability as being error variance. When it comes to the mean square within groups, the larger the value, the greater the variability within the treatment conditions. Earlier I said the mean square within groups is the denominator in our formula for F in computing obtained F statistic. It's the thing that appears below the divisor line. Mean square within is the denominator. Earlier I said Remember that researchers typically desire to get statistically significant results. Earlier I also said that the no effect value for the obtained F statistic is 1.0. Uh, since researchers want significant results, researchers typically hope that their obtained F value is going to be bigger than 1.0. Now why is that the case? Why is it if you're the one doing this investigation, uh, you hope that your obtained F statistic will be bigger than 1.0? Well, think of the our formula for computing F in this way. Think of the mean square between groups as representing signal and the mean square within groups as representing noise. Think in terms of the signal to noise ratio. Now, this goes back to early radio days. You are hunting for a radio station to listen to as you dial up and down the spectrum. Mostly all you hear is noise, static, like sss. But every now and then you think you hear somebody speaking. And if you fine tune it just right, you can hear somebody speaking. When that's the case, you've got a relatively strong signal to noise ratio. Now, it's in the early radio days, but the analogy works when it comes to statistics as well. If your mean square between is large, that means you're getting a large signal. Your independent variable is relatively strong. And if your mean square within is relatively small, that means you're getting relatively little noise. Your within group's variance is relatively low. So, uh, mean square between reflects signal. Think of the signal as being the effects of the independent variable. Mean square within reflects just noise. Think of it as being error variance. We're likely to get statistically significant results if our between groups variability is relatively big and our within groups variability is relatively weensy. That is, it's relatively small. Here's my memory device, my mnemonic device. The between groups variability should be big, the within groups variability should be weensy. Now ideally I should say between should be big and within should be small but I wanted uh, the letters to match. Uh, B is the first letter in between, it's also the first letter in big. Uh, w is the first letter in within, it's also the first letter in weensy. I was hoping this memory device would help you to remember in most cases you hope your between variance will be big, you hope your within variance will be weensy or small. There's at least two strategies for achieving this. Strategy one is the strategy that most researchers pursue uh, and I lecture on this in statistics because a lot of the students in this class are going to go on to do experiments and experimental psychology and you probably want to get statistically significant results. Strategy one for getting significant results is increase the between groups variability. In other words, maximize the differences between the means of your various treatment conditions. A good way of achieving this, use a sledgehammer independent variable. What do you mean sledgehammer independent variable? I mean, in short, that you have substantial differences in the treatments that are experienced by your various groups of participants give you an example of a wimpy independent variable and a sledgehammer independent variable in our current study that deals with financial incentives. 
Uh, here's a wimpy independent variable. You would not want to conduct your current financial incentives and exercise minute study this way. A bad way to do the study is set it up so that your low incentive condition is told at the end of the semester, I'm going to count how many minutes you of exercise you got in a typical week of the semester. I'll pay you $1 per minute of exercise you got in a typical week. So if you engage in 60 minutes of exercise in a typical week, I will pay you a total of $60 at the end of the semester. Not $60 per week, but a total of $60. Uh, on the other hand, uh, people in medium incentive condition are told, I'll give you $2 per minute of exercise in a typical week. So if you engage in 60 minutes of exercise, you'll get $120 at the end of the semester. High incentive condition, uh, people are told, I'll give you $3 per minute. Uh, so they'll get $180 at the end of the semester. There's hardly any difference between the amount of money you're giving these three groups, $60 versus $120 versus $180. I don't think that's going to produce any kind of effect at the end of the semester. Wimpy independent variable is bad. Better strategy uses sledgehammer independent variable. Make sure there's big differences between the values of your independent variable. Uh, with sledgehammer independent variable, I tell my low incentive people at the end of the semester, I'll give you $1 for every minute of exercise you showed in a typical week. Medium incentive condition uh, is given a much bigger incentive. I'll pay you $25 for every minute of exercise you give me. High incentive condition is, is told much bigger incentive. I'll give you $50 for every minute of exercise you give me. And don't quote me on these numbers, but if my memory's right, I think at the end of the semester, if people engaged in an average of 60 minutes of exercise in a typical week, these people would get $60 at the end of the semester. These people would get $1,500. And these people would get $3,000 at the end of the semester. I think those numbers are right. Big differences between the treatment conditions now, much more likely to get significant differences in the exercise minutes they display. That's why we call it sledgehammer independent variable. That's the way you want to conduct your study. I illustrate this in the next slide. Uh, study A, this graph illustrates my wimpy independent variable. Study B uh, represents my sledgehammer independent variable. Now, I'll take this all with a grain of salt because I just made up these results. Wimpy independent variable, there's very little difference between the mean showed by the low incentive condition versus the medium incentive condition versus the high incentive condition. I bet if I analyze this, I'd get non-significant results. That's why I call it wimpy independent variable. But study B, there's big differences between how much money I'd give these folks for exercising. And therefore, I'd be more likely to get a result where these people engaged in very little exercise on average. These people engaged in a little bit more but the high incentive condition, they had big money to make. They engaged in substantially more minutes of exercise. Sledgehammer independent variable, much more likely to give me significant results. Now, this is the strategy that I recommend for most of you when you later take Psych 305. Design your study so you've got a sledgehammer independent variable. It's not the only way of getting statistically significant results. Strategy two for getting statistically significant results is to instead decrease the within groups variability in your investigation. Decrease the within groups variability. What do you mean by that? Conduct your research using homogeneous samples. That is, use participants that are similar to each other with respect to their scores on the dependent variable before you even manipulate the independent variable. Put together samples where the people are similar to each other across the different treatment conditions before you start manipulating anything. Concrete example with our current study on exercise minutes. Let's pretend for a minute that age is related to exercise minutes. Let's pretend for a uh, minute that before you even manipulate anything, younger people tend to exercise more minutes per week. Bad strategy, if this is true, bad strategy for conducting your study is to do it with participants of widely differing age, ages. 
A good strategy, a better strategy, would be to conduct your study with participants who are homogeneous on age. Let's illustrate what this might look like with respect to fictitious outcomes. We have study C and study D. Study C is bad. Uh, within treatment conditions, there's great variability in ages. Ages of my subjects might be anywhere from as young as 18 to as old as 70. And that means that they're going to be very different with respect to the scores they display on the dependent variable. Maybe this, dot, this person engaged in a lot of minutes of exercise because she was very young. She was 18. Maybe this person engaged in very little exercise because she was older. She was 70 years old. I've got a lot of variability within the treatment condition. That's bad. Similarly, a lot of variability within the treatment condition here. That's bad. A lot of variability within the treatment condition here. That is bad. Uh, okay, this is a situation where I'm not using homogeneous samples. Study D, I use homogeneous samples. They're homogeneous with respect to age. Specifically, everybody in this investigation is exactly 30 years old. Let's imagine typical 30-year-olds are similar to each other with respect to how many minutes of exercise they get in a typical week. So now, when I look at my low incentive condition, it's a very tight cluster of scores. Uh, when I look at my medium incentive condition, tight cluster of scores, high incentive condition, tight cluster of scores. In doing analysis of variance, it is as if the software does the following. Now, this is not what the software actually does. This is a metaphor, but imagine it this way. It's as if the software looks at these dots and the software asks itself, do I see a difference between this cluster versus this cluster versus this cluster? I think I do. Here is a tight cluster of scores, and this cluster is so different from this cluster that they don't even overlap at all. Notice that the lowest individual score in this cluster is higher than the highest individual score in this cluster. Clearly, there's a big difference between this cluster versus this cluster. I think you've got statistically significant results here. That's why I say study D is good. In contrast, if the software, statistical software, to look, were to look at these clusters, you would say, you know, I don't see much difference between this cluster versus this cluster. The scores are all spread out. There's all kinds of overlap between the scores shown by the high incentive people and the scores shown by the low incentive people. So much overlap, I don't think I really see a difference between the clusters. I think you don't have statistically significant results in study C. That's why I call it bad. So we got significant results here because everybody was homogeneous with respect to age. That made a difference in how tight the clusters were. So that's my information for this lecture. Let's summarize the main points that I wanted to make. Summary the main points from this lecture. When you do analysis of variance, your omnibus null hypothesis is going to be a prediction of zero overall relationship between independent variable and dependent variable. You're not getting specific about specific treatment condition means. Uh, omnibus null hypothesis just says that overall there's zero relationship between the independent variable and dependent variable. Another main point made today between groups variability is the extent to which the means of the various treatment conditions deviate from the grand mean of the total sample. Between groups variability is quantified by the mean square between represented by this symbol. Still talking about main points made in today's lecture. Within groups variability is the extent to which the scores of individual participants differ from the mean of their treatment condition. Within groups variability is quantified by the statistic mean square within which we will represent using this symbol ms with a wn subscript. Still summarizing main points. We typically hope to reject the omnibus null hypothesis of zero overall relationship between independent variable dependent variable. Um, 
this omnibus test is based on our obtained F statistic, which is computed using this formula. Uh, now, don't worry about memorizing this formula right now. You're going to see this formula referred to again in subsequent lectures. I do want you to remember that the no effect value for an obtained F statistic is 1.0. For just about every statistic you learn this semester, I want you to know what's the no effect value. For an F statistic, the no effect value is 1.0. In order to reject the null hypothesis, in order to make this obtained F statistic bigger than 1.0, you're going to have to either increase the size of the mean square between, or you're going to have to decrease the size of the mean square within. Uh, my next lecture, not available at the mo this very moment, but hopefully will be available soon. Um, the well, not my next lecture, but the next activity. Uh, the next activity for our class is doing discussion exercise 132.30 between versus within variance. At this point, at the time I'm making this recording, I'm investigating Canvas and how I can facilitate you folks doing uh, kind of a discussion of this exercise online in Canvas. I'm going to investigate it further, look for an email from me, and I'll indicate whether I've decided to use the discussion tool in Canvas for this purpose, or maybe I'll decide not to use the discussion tool in Canvas for this purpose. Uh, but I hope to make this discussion exercise feasible uh, by using one of the tools within Canvas. You will hear from me later when I've made that decision. One way or another, eventually I want to release this online quiz, VQ 132.30 between, within, variance. Here it says 30-minute uh, time limit, one submission, available at such, such date. Uh, this quiz is not available right now. You don't need to worry about it being released without you knowing it. Whenever I do release this online quiz, I will send out an email announcement announcing that it's available. I need to think through how we're going to handle the discussion exercise, and I'll give you plenty of heads up. Uh, before I actually release this online quiz. I do want to release it because I know students in the class generally like the online quizzes. Uh, they're a good source of easy points. Anyhow, that's my lecture on between versus within variance. Uh, look for future emails from me in which I talk about the next step that we're going to take in the course.